Alrighty, well, um, this week we're going to continue to study uh, the uh, doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And again, I don't want to rehearse why it is we've uh, been looking at it, but again, as I mentioned in my prayer, uh, the Holy Spirit is one that uh, we have a lot to do with. And so we should know something more about Him and more about His work and why it is the Spirit of God is the one who does the work that He does. Now, uh, just by way of quick review, we have seen that the Holy Spirit is a person, and I keep uh, emphasizing this because I tend to think that we don't often think of him in terms of his personality, but rather in terms of what he does. Uh, so oftentimes we might um, think of him more as a force or a power as well. Perhaps we'll confuse him with love, even though he is the one who produces love. But remember, he is one who thinks one who guides, one who commands and convicts. He is one who loves, one who prays, one who comforts. He can be resisted, he can be grieved, quenched, lied to, and blasphemed. So we do need to make sure we treat him well. And of course, we've seen he's not only a person, but he is God. He is called God in Scripture. He does have the attributes of God. Some of the ones we saw were the fact that he is eternal, omnipresent, creates. He has infinite knowledge. Certainly he can be blasphemed and to blaspheme the Holy Spirit is unpardonable. His name is used also in conjunction with the Father and the Son that shows that he is equal. And then we've seen that he is distinct from the Father and the Son. We're going to see more about this this evening. Actually, Jesus sends the Spirit of God. He can't be and send the Spirit at the same time. The Father also sends the Holy Spirit. The Spirit descended at Jesus' baptism, and the Father's voice spoke from heaven. Uh, obviously, the relationship they sustain uh, is one that shows that they are distinct persons. Now, we've also been looking at why he is called the Spirit of God. And remember that God has, uh, we saw last time, and this was something a little bit difficult to understand, and actually, I do want us to spend a little bit more time on it this evening, at least to uh, get a better understanding of what it was that Jonathan Edwards was driving at. But the one thing that is, I think, well, I believe at least mostly undisputed within uh, the um, history of the Christian church is the fact that the, the names that God reveals himself by, and I'm thinking particularly about the Father, Son, and Spirit, are meant to reveal certain things about him and about each of the persons that distinguishes them from one another. I mean, so that uh, the Son may not be called the Father in the sense the Father is, or the Spirit, uh, the Father and the Son called the Spirit. And we saw that um, actually each one of those has a particular meaning. Uh, Father is the one who begets. The Son is the one who is begotten, the Spirit is the one who proceeds or the one who is breathed out by the Father and the Son. Now again, uh, I think that a lot of what is cold um, with regard to these relationships comes from things that they actually do uh, in the Bible. For instance, the Father is the one who sends the Son into the world. He's born of the Virgin. Uh, the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son in time Jesus says, I, I need to go to the Father. It's important that I do because if I don't go, then I will not, or he, well, the, the, the uh, Spirit may not come to you. But if I go, I will send him. And he also talks about the Father as the one who's going to send the Spirit. Uh, those are things that actually take place in history. But yet, looking at what it is the Father and Son do, uh, and the relationship the Spirit seems to have from them and the fact that Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. It seems like what they're doing is deducing from this, as well as from the names, what their relationships actually are uh, in and of themselves. Um, I, maybe I could ask this question to see if any of you remember. What are the two different names for uh, the, the study of God as far as... Um, you know, what, what, do we call, what do we call it when we study who God is in and of himself apart from his work and apart from creation and redemption? And what do we call the study of God when we're studying the things that he actually does in the work of redemption? Does anybody remember what those terms are? Okay. 
which one would that have to do with? Who, who God is in and of himself. And then the other, so that's the, ont we call it the ontological trinity. And then the other one is called what? The, the economic trinity. And we're going to study that as soon as we finish looking at the ontological trinity because that actually has to do with the work that each one of them does. And we're going to focus primarily on that of the Holy Spirit. But let me give you one of those formulations of the ontological trinity that comes from the Westminster Confession of Faith. It says, in the unity of the Godhead, there be three persons of one substance, power, and eternity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. The Father is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father, the Holy Ghost eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son. Now, again, that may sound strange if you had never been exposed to that kind of thinking before. What do they have in mind here? Well, again, they're just trying to sort out historically what the church has believed regarding the relationship of the three persons. Now, if I were to ask you, is, was there a time when the Son did not exist? Was there a time when there was only the Father? What would you say? Okay, no. The Son has always existed. Is there a time when the Spirit didn't exist? Okay. Even though we're talking about the Father begetting the Son and the Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son, we're not talking about something that God decided to do some, one, at some point um, in eternity, if you can talk about eternity in terms of points. It's something that has always been. It wasn't a decision that God make, made at all. It's rather His nature to do this. Uh, it's his nature to be triune. It's the nature of the Father to beget the Son. It's the nature of the Father and the Son to, um, for the Spirit to proceed from, from either or from both of them. Now, what I wanted to do is I wanted to, because uh, I know that Edward's view sounded strange, and it's probably still going to sound strange after I've explained it a little bit more thoroughly this evening. But I wanted to spend time on what he has to say because I think as Edwards looks at other things in Scripture that are said about the Son and that are said about the Spirit, he, he draws from that a little bit more of this understanding of the persons of the Trinity and what actually distinguish them, distinguishes them and what's meant by the eternal begottenness of the Son, what's meant by the Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son. Now, I did try to take a crack at it last week. I'm going to um, just do it again just because if, if he's right, it really does open our understanding of why the different persons of the Godhead take the roles that they do in the working out of salvation or in what we call the economic trinity, okay? So, first of all, how are we to understand the eternal begottenness of the Son? Now, here's, here's a few things that Edward says. Let me just give to you what I, th what I believe he's saying, and then I'll read a couple of quotes from him, and you can see, I hope, that that is, in fact, what he's saying. So, first of all, he believes that it is the nature of God, or we might say the Father, um, to delight in what is perfect or what is best. And that's been his nature from all eternity. He loves what is best. And when you love something, you think about it, okay? That's something he would necessarily do. So what is it that he thinks about? What is it that he delights in more than anything else? Uh, well, especially considering there was nothing else, right? And even if there was everything else, even after he had created, the same thing would be true. What is it that God delights in more than anything else? It would be himself, okay, because he alone is perfect. And so throughout eternity, Edward surmises, he's eternally considering or thinking about himself. And his understanding of himself, he says, is, very, is a perfect understanding. It's a very complete understanding. And he believes it to be, and this, this is where there may seem like there's a little bit of a jump, but um, he says it's something, his idea of himself is distinct from himself. I mean, it's a part of his thinking. 
It's a part of the Godhead, but he would say God and the idea of God are two different things. Now, what he says is that this perfect idea that he has of himself, this perfect idea of his image is actually the sun. And this is what actually causes, you might say, or causes the son to be derived from the father or gives rise to the person of the son. Now, the reason why he believes that is because throughout scripture, the son is called by various names. For one thing, he is called the image of God. In Hebrews, excuse me, in Colossians 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He's called, secondly, the perfect representation of his nature, Hebrews 1.3. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. Okay, so he's his image and he is his exact representation. Thirdly, uh, he is... Well, let me ask you, what is, the, what is the term that is used of Jesus in John chapter 1 when he's being introduced? What is he called? He's called the Word. And uh, I don't know if you've heard any expositions on what Word means, but what do you think it means? Okay, well, what is... What's that? Okay, the expression of God. What, what kind of an expression is he? You see, is, is the question that Edwards is asking. There you go, okay. Verbal, logical, rational, he is, um, I think you might say, he is the rationality of God, some have said. Uh, the perfect rational expression of himself. John, let me read a few verses from John 1.1 1, 1 and see what you think. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory... Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. So the idea is that this word is the rationality of God, as it were, or as Edwards would say in line, in keeping with his, with his line of reasoning, it is this this perfect understanding or image or reflection of God. I mean, he basically likens it to if God were looking at himself in a mirror, that reflection would be the sun. He is the image. He is the exact representation of his nature. And he is the one who fully expresses God. This is the one who became flesh and dwelt among us and explained him. So here's a couple quotes from Edwards now. If you, if you may not necessarily agree with him, but... Um, See if, um, if you at least understand what he's saying. Therefore, as God, with perfect clearness, fullness, and strength, understands himself, views his own essence, that idea which God has of himself is absolutely himself. This representation of the divine nature and essence is the divine nature and essence again, so that by God's thinking of the deity, the Son must certainly be generated. Hereby there is another person begotten. There is another infinite, eternal, almighty, and most holy, and the same God, the very same divine nature. And this person is the second person in the Trinity, the only begotten and dearly beloved Son of God. He is the eternal necessary, perfect, substantial, and personal idea which God has of himself. And that it is so seems to me to be abundantly confirmed by the word of God. Now again, we are talking about things that are rel you know, relatively strange and unknown to us. But he is saying because of the, the terms that are being used of the Lord Jesus Christ, the fact that he is the image of God, the fact that he is the representation of his nature, the fact that he is the rationality of God, he believes that the Son is actually God's, the Father's perfect idea of himself, and that having this idea eternally, not something he chose to do, not something that happened at a certain point in time, but the fact that he is eternally contemplating, as it were, his own image is what gives rise to the Son. Now, moving on from there, 
the Father and the Son, as we've seen, eternally love and have joy and delight in each other. And this gives rise, he says, to the Holy Spirit. Now, let me give you a following quote. The Godhead being thus begotten by God's loving an idea of himself. And he means here now there's no longer, well, there was never a time when there was one person. The Godhead would be referring to the eternal trinity. But the Godhead being thus begotten by God's loving an idea of himself and showing forth in a distinct person in that idea, there proceeds a most pure act and an infinitely holy and sacred energy arises between the Father and Son in mutually loving and delighting in each other for their love and joy is mutual. Proverbs 8.30 which many believe referring to the father, well, actually the, the son speaking to the father. I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. This is the eternal and most perfect and essential act of the divine nature, wherein the Godhead acts to an infinite degree and in the most perfect manner possible. The deity becomes all act. The divine essence itself flows out and is, as it were, breathed forth in love and joy so that the Godhead therein stands forth in yet another manner of subsistence, and there proceeds the third person in the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Okay, so basically the idea is, as the Father looks at his image, and he loves it, and as this image is a person, and loves the Father in return, there is this love that they share between them, and in this love, there's this flowing out of the divine essence that becomes the person of the Holy Spirit. So, as we saw last week, the Son is the image of God, the Holy Spirit is the love of God, okay? And it actually seems to square with a lot of what we see in Scripture, which is why Edwards believed it to be true. I mean, the Spirit is called the love of God. We saw that last week in John 17, verses 25 and 26. Jesus says, O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you. And these have known that you sent me, and I have made your name known to them and will make it known, so that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. And again, it's a strange idea that God's love would be in them, not necessarily upon them, not that you would love them the way you love me, but that the love with which you love me would be in them and I would be in them. And I think we all agree that the Holy Spirit dwells in us, or I should say this, that Jesus dwells in us by his Holy Spirit. So Jesus says, I pray that I might be in them, and that's basically the same thing as the love with which you have loved me being in them, and we know that that is the Holy Spirit. And then 1 John 4, verses 12 and 13, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. So the idea of God abiding in us, of God's love being perfected in us, is basically the same as God's having given us his Holy Spirit. So again, the idea of the Spirit being love. What is it that the Spirit of God produces when he is actually in the heart of a redeemed soul? He produces love, which means he makes you to love what it is that God loves. You know, it's that, that idea that Christ is praying for that we would have this kind of love. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. By the way, Edwards also shows in another place that all these fruits of the Spirit are basically just different manifestations of love. Love is at the root of each one of them. If you, if you say you're gentle, it's, you know, it's basically showing love in, in a particular way. Uh, he has a much more... Um, Profound way of putting it, of course. If you walk by the Spirit, Paul says, you won't carry out the deeds of the flesh. But what are the deeds of the flesh except those acts of hatred against God? If we're walking by the Spirit, who is love, then we won't carry out the deeds of the flesh, which are hatred against God. And again, realizing, too, that when God puts the Spirit of God within your heart, 
It breaks the power of sin because it puts in you a new principle that fights against the old principle, and that new principle is love. Uh, Edwards also points out that since, since the Holy Spirit is in essence the love that the Father and the Son share for one another, and again, it's not just an impersonal love, but it actually is a personal, uh, it's a, well, it's a person of the Godhead. It's, it's still same God, same attributes, same substance, and so forth, but now a different person, but he says that that's the reason why in Scripture he's not only called the love of God, but he's also called the joy of God and why it is that he's the one that brings comfort because, again, all of these things have to do with love. I mean, for instance, Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So the idea of peace and joy, he also makes a lot about the fact that the Spirit of God, when he's pictured in the Bible, is pictured as a dove, which uh, often is a symbol of peace. And peace, again, is one of those fruits he would see coming from love, as well as the fact that he is the comforter. I mean, he is the one who helps, he's the one who guides, he's the one who instructs, he's the one who reveals to us the will of God, but he's also the one that brings that comfort, which is joy in the midst of difficulties. So again, he has that particular office, and it seems to go along with his particular nature, by the way, I think Edwards would actually say that uh, the Spirit of God being the love of God, when it says that God is love, the Holy Spirit is that love of God, which again sounds kind of interesting. We'd have to uh, think about that for a bit, but here's a summary statement regarding what Edwards says about the Trinity. It is common when speaking of the divine happiness, that is the happiness that God has, to say that God is infinitely happy in the enjoyment of himself, in perfectly beholding and infinitely loving and rejoicing in his own essence and perfection. And accordingly, it must be supposed that God perpetually and eternally has a most perfect idea of himself, as it were an exact image and representation of himself ever before him and in actual view. And from hence arises a most pure and perfect act or energy in the Godhead, which is the divine love, complacence, and joy. So again, this is Edward's explanation of the eternal generation of the Son, the eternal begetting of the Son, and the eternal procession of the Spirit from the Father and the Son. And I think what he's doing here is he's not only taking, of course, what these names mean in and of themselves, but he's also drawing from Scripture those things said about the Son of God, those things that are said in particular about him, those things that are said in particular about the Spirit of God. And he's drawing from that uh, more of the nature of this, and he's trying to reason out how this could possibly be. Why is Jesus called the image of God, for instance? And why is the Spirit called the love of God? Why isn't Jesus called the love of God? You know, why isn't the Spirit called the image of God? He, he's not. So again, trying to make sense of the biblical data. Now, what, what difference does it really make? I, I should say at this point, whether you accept this particular uh, explanation of the ontological trinity or not, it, it is true. Jesus is the image of God. He is the, the, the word of God. He is the rational expression of God. He, he shares the nature of God. And he, because of that, and being the Son of God is going to do particular things. And the Spirit of God is sent into the world to do particular things as well in the work of redemption. However, if you kind of accept, if you accept this particular position, it might help you understand a little bit more why each person actually does what they do. Okay, so the ontological trinity is basically the study of God as he is in and of himself throughout all eternity before he created anything and as he continues right now just considered within his own being. It's just within, within the Trinity, there's three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each of them share the same attributes. Each of them has the same power, the same glory. There is no subordination within the Trinity, except if you consider this idea of, of um, well, the eternal begottenness of the Son and the procession of the Spirit there is this idea of one deriving their, their personality or their being from the other. 
And there's sort of a priority. The father seems to have the priority. He's the one who begets the son. And the son is, is the one along with the father that the spirit begets. So this idea of priority of derivation, that sounds kind of strange. But they're all eternal. They're all equal. They, they are all God. And there is no subordination within the Godhead itself. Now, that, by the way, is... Um, when we say that Jesus Christ is, is God in human flesh, we say that he is to be honored and worshiped as God, that he is you know, equal in power and authority and glory with the Father and with the Spirit of God. And then we come to the subject of the economic trinity and then we run into these different kinds of situations where we see things like Jesus saying the Father is greater than I or there are certain things he doesn't know or you know, things of this nature. But well, we need to understand that there is another way in which the Trinity can be understood. And that's what we call the economic Trinity. Within the economy of salvation, or the plan of salvation, each of the persons of the Godhead takes upon him a different role. And within that understanding of the Trinity, there is a voluntary subordination where one is going to have precedence over the other. One is going to have a greater authority. The other is going to submit to that authority. But it doesn't mean that with regard to uh, who they are as God, that there is any subordination of authority or, or being. Okay? That, that can be real helpful when you're talking to Jehovah's Witnesses and so forth and trying to explain to them why you believe Jesus is God and yet he's ignorant of certain things, why you believe that Jesus is God, and yet he says that Father is greater than I. Okay, because of this voluntary subordination to do this particular work, which is the work of redemption. Now, I think that the role that each of them plays actually reflects what is true of each person in this ontological relationship, how they are in, in, in and of themselves. I mean, if, if you think about it, who is it that seems to be taking the, um, oh, I don't know, the leadership role in the work of salvation? Who would, who would to you, as far as when you consider uh, the work that's actually done, who seems to be the one that's at the helm? Hmm? Okay. Now, Jesus is the one who is sent, right? So is Jesus the one? Yeah, so which one would be? seeming to have the, the greatest authority. Okay. You're right that Jesus is put out as the one that most attention is drawn to, okay? But when it comes to the idea of subordination, the Father seems to have the primary role of authority. And in, in the Godhead, as far as we just were talking about, the Father is the one eternally contemplating this image that gives rise to the Son, and then the Spirit proceeds from both there seems to be somewhat of a primacy of the Father within the Godhead, and there is in the work of redemption. I mean, the Father is the one who, I mean, it, actually it's, it's hard to separate these things out, but he does seem to take a leadership role. What, is, what do we know that the Father actually does? What are some of the things that he does in the work of redemption? He chooses. Yeah, he is the one who is represented as choosing whom he's going to save. Okay, and what else does the Father do? He sends the Son into the world. That's right. That's the thing that the Father does. Okay, eventually he will, yes, send the Spirit. And a couple of other things, uh, when the Son comes into the world and He redeems uh, those whom He's going to redeem, then the Father receives them into the family, doesn't He? And He also gives those people to His Son as a reward for the work that He does. And of course, He bestows a great deal of honor upon the Son for the work that He does. It, see, there's a primacy, it appears, of, of the Father, which you would expect from, again, the relationship with, it just seems natural that that would be how it would fall out. And that is, as a matter of fact, how it works out in, um, in the work of redemption. Now, with regard to the Son, okay, the Son submits to the Father, 
By the way, um, when you have a father and son relationship, what, where, where does the authority usually lie? In a well, actually, where does it always lie in a father and son relationship? If the father has the authority and the son submits to it. Now, if one is going to come into the world and is going to take on the role of a servant and be a dutiful son to his father, which person of the Godhead do you think would be the one that would do that? The Spirit, <laughs> okay. Now it's going to be the Son, right? And it would, seem, it would seem logical, it would seem natural, if we can put it that way, or supernatural since we're talking about God, that that would be the case. So he submits to the Father. He takes the role of a servant. And by the way, this is one of the reasons why Jesus says, the Father is greater than I. Because in the work of redemption, in the position that Jesus Christ has taken, the Father is, in fact, in higher authority. The Father sends the Son. The Son submits to the Father. What is it that Jesus is doing while he's in the world? He says, whatever the Father shows me, that's what I'm going to do. You know, my meat and drink is to do the will of him who sent me. Does it sound to you like there's some subordination going on there? Okay, so can he say the Father is greater than I with regard to authority? He can say that. And it's true. And can he say that the Father is greater than he is in any other way? Is it just a matter of authority? I mean, who is it that's saying this? It is Jesus, and Jesus is. That's right. He, he becomes fully a man. And when Jesus speaks on earth, I mean, is he speaking as a man or is he speaking as God? I mean, when he says, for instance, of that day and that hour, no one knows, not the Son, not, not the, uh, the angels, but the Father only. Is he speaking as God or is he speaking as man? As a man, he has the limitations of, of humanity. I mean, the person is divine, but again, remember that the man Christ Jesus was not a deified human nature. He was fully a man. The person is the same person as the second person of the Godhead, as the Son of God, but Jesus Christ is fully a man, and when he speaks, he speaks from human understanding and knowledge, and also as a, as a man. So when he says the Father is greater than I, he's as greater than he is, as God is greater than a human being. So it shouldn't surprise us that he would say that, but also, you know, it's obvious that at the same time that he's God, because uh, he was worshipped, and again, all the things that are said about the Son with regard to creation and so forth. Okay, now he's sent into the world, he's conceived, he's born of a virgin, he becomes the son of God with regard to his human nature, and I think that just simply reflects what he was eternally. And I don't think that there's any, any question, any debate about that. But now think about what Jesus Christ has come to do. He did come, of course, to, to live a perfect life, and he did that in obedience to the Father, and again, Father in authority, Son in submission, if someone's going to obey, it makes sense the Son would come to obey and not the Father would come to obey the Son, okay? But what else did Jesus Christ come to do? We, we already read a little bit about it in um, John chapter 1. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained him. Now, Jesus is called the image of God. Jesus is the, uh, the verbal expression of who God is. I mean, he's the exact representation of his nature, as we've already seen. He is the, the, the rationality, so to speak, of God. Doesn't it make sense that this one would come into the world if God wanted to reveal himself, that this would be the one that he would send? The one who is the image, the one who is the nature, the one who is the word of God. Okay. His particular role is to explain God. I mean, the, I think the, um, <clears throat> the literal word in the Greek is the same word that's used. To we get the word exegesis, the idea of uh, going into a text of Scripture and trying to understand what it means. And then, you know, after we've understood it, we explain it. Well, Jesus has come to exegete the Father. 
He's come to explain him to us. And of course, he can do that because he is the image of God. Okay. So again, Edward sees a relationship between who the Son of God is with the particular uh, work that he comes to do. And, and there's really no debate that being the Son, eternally the Son, that so many theologians have believed that that's why he becomes the, the Son who's actually born into the world. By the way, if I haven't mentioned it already, when we're talking about the Trinity, we're talking about as far out there as we can possibly get. So if this sounds a little bit tough, uh, it's because it is a tough subject. And then, of course, as the son, he obeys, he, he ministers the truth, he teaches, he preaches. That's how he reveals, of course, God, not only through his words, but through his nature. And then for this work, he is given honor, as we've already talked about. Now, the Spirit of God proceeds from the Father and the Son, sent by the Father and the Son. He comes into the world actually to apply what... Jesus Christ has done. He has particular work that he does. He unites us to the Lord Jesus Christ uh, spiritually, vitally. He makes us alive legally. He gives us the, the benefits, or I should say the legal standing of Jesus Christ. But in connecting us with Jesus Christ in a vital or a living way, he actually makes us alive and produces in our hearts that love, which is his nature. By the way, you're familiar with that passage in, um, I think it's uh, First Peter, I didn't actually include it in my notes, where it talks about how we've become partakers of the divine nature. And you understand that that doesn't mean that we become gods, as um, several people might, um, might say, at least within the health and wealth uh, movement. But, but the two Peter? I, th I think that sounds right. Well, let's see. Um, yeah, uh, wait a minute. Okay, yes, it's in it's 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, verse 4. Uh, For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises in order that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now, Peter certainly means certainly doesn't mean that we're becoming God in the sense that we're, you know, our created nature is becoming uncreated and that our limitations are being shed so that we're becoming unlimited. Um, I think the Worldwide Church of God, the Armstrongism, taught that if you follow their organization, do the things they say you ought to do, you eventually actually enter into the Godhead and you become one of the persons of the Godhead, which is blasphemy. But the idea is there's not three persons in the Godhead, but there's lots of persons in the Godhead, and they're all in the Worldwide Church of God. Okay. Uh, of course, there's, um, well, then, then there's those who uh, say, like in the health and wealth movement, some of the more radical ones, uh, like Kenneth Copeland and so forth, say that you are actually little gods and uh, you can exercise the power of God. Well, that's not what Peter's talking about. Uh, he is, though, talking about sharing in this uh, moral nature of God, which is what the Spirit of God produces in the heart. This, this is the divine nature that is in you. Uh, you actually are a partaker of the divine nature in the sense that the Spirit of God dwells in you, but in another sense, you're actually experiencing that divine nature. You're becoming like God morally, you know, not metaphysically, but, but morally. Uh, you are sharing his nature. So he produces that love within your heart. And again, as Jesus prayed that that love, you know, that um, the Father had for the Son might be in them. Well, that love is in us. It's the Spirit of God. And that that love may also be, of course, an active principle in our heart. That's what divides us from darkness. That's what makes us Christians. Whereas the rest of the world is without love and haters of God is that we have the divine nature, we have the love of God within us. And again, I think you can see that um, if Edwards was right about the nature of the Spirit of God, that he is in fact the love of God, which I don't think there's any question that, that that is what he's called, that's why the Spirit of God is the one who does this particular work of connecting us to Christ and producing this particular nature within us. Morton Smith says uh, this regarding um, 
the economic trinity. He says the economic relations reveal appropriate distinctions which rest upon these eternal personal distinctions. It is the Father who is usually thought of as the source of creation. The Son is the one who has come to do the bidding of the Father in the covenant of grace, and the Holy Spirit is sent by both the Father and the Son to apply the work of redemption accomplished by the Son. Now, that's, that's generally what is believed regarding the economic trinity. You know, this is how it works, but Edwards goes a little bit deeper, and he says the reason why Jesus comes as the prophet of God to reveal God is because he is the image of God. And the reason why the Spirit of God is the one who produces what he does in our hearts is because he is the love of God, okay? So Edwards is taking it just a couple steps further and trying to explain to us why it is that each of the persons does what they do in the work of redemption. And again, really, that is, seems to be the entire work of the Spirit of God is, is to produce that nature within us. You know, we're talking about in the evening services about putting our sin to death and putting on obedience or putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. That just simply means yielding more to the Spirit of God, uh, letting that principle of love grow stronger and stronger in our hearts and, and killing that hatred we have in our hearts against God and against His will so that we become more and more obedient, we become more and more like Jesus Christ and become less and less like the world. It all stems from this. By the way, one thing I should mention about the economic trinity is that um, it, it is believed that um, this relationship that they have in this work is, is something that they actually agreed upon throughout all eternity because, again, the work of redemption is an eternal plan or purpose of God. You know, that he was always going to create, he was always going to redeem. This is something that has always been a part of his thinking. He doesn't just sit down in eternity and say, what do I want to do today, you know? Well, let's see, I should work out a plan and then work it out. No, I mean, this is something he's always wanted to do. He's always purposed to do. It's something that uh, is a part of God. And so this arrangement, this subordination is something that has always been in the Trinity, and yet it's been represented in church history as a covenant that they actually make with each other. Uh, the covenant, either called the covenant of grace or it's called the covenant of redemption, which is the basis of the covenant of grace. If, if you divide them, you basically have this idea that they, you know, the Father, well, actually the Son agrees to come into the world and to work out our redemption. The Spirit agrees that He's going to come into the world and apply that redemption, and that's the, the covenant of redemption. And the covenant of grace is where the Father promises that he's going to save all of these people and that Jesus is going to be their surety and the Spirit of God, again, is going to uh, do his work of applying. And because they're so similar that some put it together, some divide it. But really, can we talk about the um, Trinity making an agreement or a covenant? You know, it's, was there a time when there was no covenant? No. I mean, you really can't talk about God in those terms, but that there is this eternal purpose to do this, I think we can say at least that much. <laughs> but again, what they do is consistent with their nature. Either, you know, the one step that church history has accepted or the further step that Jonathan Edwards has taken, either way, it, it does appear that what they do is consistent with who they are. Now that, like I said, that's kind of out there, but um, hopefully it, it gives you a little bit of a handle on understanding uh, something about the Trinity. And I hope it cements, too, the idea that the Holy Spirit is a person and He is a divine person, that the three persons of the Godhead are separate persons and so forth, but they are all involved in the work of redemption, and so they should all be glorified and honored for that work. It does appear that the Father, though, is drawing particular attention, as uh, was mentioned a little bit earlier, to the Son. And the Spirit of God doesn't draw attention to Himself. He draws attention to the Son. The Son, though, it's interestingly enough, draws attention to the Father. But the Father is bestowing honor on the Son. So it's hard to say where the preeminence is there, but certainly Christ is the one that the Father has sent into the world, and He wants us to see what His Son uh, has done. And uh, we do need to pay attention to that if we are to give glory and honor to the Father, certainly if we're going to be saved. And uh, we need the Spirit of God working this grace in us so that we can do this. Well, 
Okay. Enough said. Are there any questions about that? Why did the son have to leave? Um, you know, it, it, it really couldn't be any other reason than that it was God's will that it be that way. I mean, there's, there's probably no other explanation. Uh, Jesus was presently the comfort for his disciples. But obviously, he, he in, his, in his humanity could only, well, he still had to go through his work, of course, and he had to ascend, and he had to, maybe it's the idea of having to complete his work before the Spirit could be sent. So that's, that's one thing. Uh, the other is that he's not going to leave them without comfort. And when he leaves, and that was inevitable, he was going to send the Spirit. But apparently the Spirit wasn't going to come in the same way that he was after Jesus ascended until he actually did ascend. And that's probably because of his completed work. I mean, after all, he, he did have to do that work so the Father would have the basis upon which to grant the Spirit of God. Although he was granting the Spirit before Jesus died on the basis of the death that Jesus would die. But apparently there was something in the plan of God that necessitated this work being completed before this greater work began. Yes? Isn't there something to do with um, coronation? Because when he ascended on high, he gave this to the men. Uh, certainly that is what happened. I guess the, the, the question I think she's asking is why did it have to be that way? But, but that certainly is the case, yes. And when he ascends, as a matter of fact, the fact that he had ascended and was, and was crowned was the, I think the outpouring of the Spirit was the evidence that that had taken place. Didn't Jesus say that if I do not ascend, the Spirit will not come? If I do not go, the Spirit will not come? Something, like Something to that effect. He did say it was important for you that I go away, for if I do not go, the Spirit will not come. God, I'm not sure what the word is that would not come or would not be sent at least in the sense that he was referring to there, not absolutely. Yeah, it's in John, it's either 14, 15, or 16. Oh, wait a minute, here it is. It's in 16, verse 7. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper shall not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So apparently he needed to go in order to send him. But perhaps, again, it was something that the father had entrusted to the son as one of the honors that he would bestow upon him so that once he was crowned with that honor and authority over all things, he was also given this authority to send the spirit. So it, it's, that's probably the connection. He had to go. He had to receive that honor. He had to be coronated before he could send the spirit, perhaps before he had the authority to do it, or the honor given to him by the Father to do it. I don't think it means that they can't occupy the world at the same time. You know, I don't think that's how we should view this. That's right. I mean, he, he was already there. He was already operative, but not in exactly the same way. And as theologians, I know within the reform camp, have tried to try to understand the difference between what was going on at that time that Jesus breathed on them and, and everything that preceded that to, to the difference afterwards. What is the difference? And the only thing they can come up with is more. There's more. Yeah, more of the Spirit's work. It's, God is pouring out His Spirit in even greater ways. It's going to be much more widespread, much more universal. There's going to be more power. Um, so more. I mean, he, he was saving before, he was gifting before, he was empowering before. I mean, all those things he was doing before, and he does them after. So what's the difference? Well, more. <laughs> that's about the best they, they can come up with, and that seems to be the case, more. All right, any, any other questions regarding this? I'm sorry that I've, I, this was more of a lecture because it's hard to ask questions about this, this kind of stuff. But what we'll do is we'll, uh, we, we want to focus a little bit more on the Spirit's work and uh, maybe take a couple of lessons and consider some of the things the Spirit of God actually does consistent 
with what we've seen here and really cement the idea of, again, how much we need the Spirit of God, not only to work Christ's nature in us, but how much we need Him to do the same thing outside the church to bring the lost to saving faith. He alone can do it. But again, what our role is in that as far as praying and as far as evangelizing. So any, any last questions or comments? All right, then, let's uh, have a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, meet in the back for a time of prayer.